Between concrete walls, there's a place for us Where we could go, where we could be alone Between city lights, we don't have to fight I wanna go, do you wanna follow? There's something in the air, I can't explain it, but it's there Ain't nobody gonna find us in a secret love affair I don't wanna have to hide no more, it shouldn't be unfair I wanna go, and I wanna know Do you wanna follow? Baby, do you wanna follow? Come with me, do you wanna follow? Baby, can't you see that? I wanna go, and I wanna know Do you wanna follow? Baby, do you wanna follow? Come with me, do you wanna follow? Baby, can't you see that? I wanna go, and I wanna know do you wanna follow? I can't understand why we can't hold hands But they don't know what we have is real love Aren't you sick and tired of having to hide? I know a place we wanna follow There's something in the air, I can't explain it but it's there Ain't nobody gonna find us in a secret love affair I don't wanna have to hide no more, it shouldn't be unfair I wanna go, and I wanna know Do you wanna follow? Baby, do you wanna follow? Come with me, do you wanna follow? Baby, can't you see that? I wanna go, and I wanna know Do you wanna follow? What's up, everybody? Welcome to live stream. Did you like that? <laughs> there was only one thing that could get me to bring back the old music, and that was an AI remix of me singing it. <laughs> Thank you to Ghost Branch FB for that. I um, I have sung in my life. I have I have sung in my life. I uh, I'm not sure there's any actual music of me singing that is worth sharing. I've shared it. I've shown. I've shown it before. What? What is it? Oh no, not that. Where would that even be? Oh, you know what it would be. Would it be in? I don't even know where that would be. Where's the last place I uploaded my music library? Is it like Spotify? Is it Google Music? I don't even. I don't even know if I have a local copy. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, welcome to the live stream, everybody. Uh, as you can tell, my singing voice is not really up to snuff right now. Uh, I have a little bit of a cold. I'm going to do my best to... Well, that's not going to stop me from streaming, obviously. But I'm going to do my best to uh, sort of muscle through and uh, try not to annoy you too much with sniffles and coughs. Such is life. Uh, how about you, Blunty? You uh, you got a cold? <laughs> no. No. Nope. No. You feeling good? Yep. I'm not around good. anyone ever. So, it, oh. it, you know, it, like I limit my interactions with people. So I, I don't have any because... kids in my life. Because you're, uh, because you're a hypochondriac or because you're an introvert? No, uh, introvert. Yeah, yeah. But it means I haven't uh, been sick in like four years. So. Oh, I'm so jealous. Yeah. I say to my wife, because uh, it's my kid, it's my freaking children all the time. It's my children. That get, I came, I was, I go on these road trips and I spend all week, uh, you know, out in public. I'm fine. I come home, I'm instantly sick and it's my children. 
And I say to my wife, does he really need to go to the playground? Does he really need social contact with other children? And she says, of course he does. He, she also says he drives her insane. Like we were snowed in. <clears throat> Excuse me. We were snowed in here uh, a few weeks ago. And they they basically couldn't leave the house because the road was icy and snowy for like five, six days. Uh, and she said he was just going, driving her crazy. So, you know, I guess it just comes with the territory. I, I'm jealous, though. Seriously. I'm jealous that you get to not be around people. I also would like to do that. Uh, Secret visuals need to get Bardwell's immune system up. Always sick. It's not my immune system. It's my children. My children are constantly bringing bugs into the house. You have no idea. Well, if you're a parent, you have some idea. Um, I have a friend who is a, uh, a teacher, uh, middle school, maybe elementary school, not high school. And uh, she basically is just like, whatever, bring it. There's no, she has no interest in trying to avoid illness because it's like pointless for her. Certain, yeah. Um, thanks to Ghost Branch FPV for that remix. He also gave me a remix of me singing uh, Eminem's Lose Yourself, which is freaking amazing, but I'm not sure that I will want to, like, we'll lose ad revenue if I show it on the stream. So I don't know if I want to show it on the stream and take the strike. But I think you guys would like to see it. So I guess the only thing to do is to tell you that if there are enough super chats asking me to play it. Uh-huh. You see how it goes? Is that, is that, uh, that's a, I don't know. Then, then I'll be like, I could, I could be convinced to play it and take, take the hit. Um, now you're going to stop people from super chatting. So they don't hear because the they don't want to hear it. Hey, you know. Um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to uh, answer your questions. I'm going to answer your questions here in the YouTube chat. I'm going to answer uh, your questions in the Discord server. Hello, patrons. This is my Discord server on the, over on the right. And uh, uh, these guys are my patrons. Thank you so much for uh, your generosity. Um, what you got to do is you got to super chat and say, like, I want to hear, I want to hear the, but then here's the thing. If like, what if it takes a half hour and I don't play it till the, and then like, you're like, you're gone. So I don't know. It's your call. It's your call. If you want to do it, it's, you know, you may have to, and obviously we're not going to put it up on the live stream clips channel because it is going to get copy struck. Uh, I probably won't get a strike. I think I'll just, it'll just get demonetized, but what are you going to do? Uh, what if I send Super Chats not to play it? <laughs> I mean, uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, should patrons hear the song first? Ghost Branch can actually share the song. Ghost Branch, are you there? Do you want to share the song in the Discord, Ghost Branch? And then people can just play it, right? Because he can just do it. It's like right here. Uh, let's see. Do you want to follow MP3? Uh, yeah, here it is. Oh, lose yourself AI cover. Oh, you know what? Oh, I'm cheating. I'm cheating. Look, he put it up on YouTube. He says it's not public. Oh, well. Uh, why can't I? I'll, I'll tell you what. If there's, I, I, if there's no, like you guys can still super chat. I just realized he put it up on YouTube. So you can see it. You can hear it without me taking the risk of getting copy struck. So I'm just going to give you the link, which if I were just like a money grubbing shill, uh, I wouldn't do that. I would make you pay for it, but I don't care about that. So uh, here's the link. You guys can go look at it. Go to, don't click away from my live stream though, but open it in another window. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that ghost bridge. Uh, so uh, here's the way the live stream works. If you're new here, by the way, if you're new here, say hi. It's good to have you. It's always good to see people coming into the hobby. Um, I'm going to take your questions. Blunty is actually queuing up the questions. The live streams have been going so smoothly ever since you started uh, queuing calls for me, Blunty. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah, um, happy to do it. He's putting them in the queue over here. You can see I'm already starting to get queued up, and I will just work my, th my way through and answer them. We usually get to the super chats 
by about the half hour mark, the 25 minute mark. I just like to spend a little time getting warmed up before we dive into the super chats. <coughs> um, and, um, oh, oh, where's my, ah, there we go. And, uh, apparently Philly Drone Life didn't interview Bobby Bags. Is it a new interview or the same story? Did, where did he do an interview? Anybody know? I saw a brief interview he gave. There was a story about his charges. Um, I I saw something today that might interest you. So the, for those of you who don't know, quick quick uh, catch up. Philly Drone Life uh, is a YouTuber who got dinged for uh, flying without... Well, what he got officially dinged for was flying without a 107, but he was also flying at night and flying over people and flying over the city. Just uh, doing a lot of things that the FCC or FAA doesn't want him to do. And I thought it was interesting uh, because he, he, he got a bunch of fines. Long story short, he got a bunch of fines. Like the FAA, he went to a meeting with the FAA. They counseled him. They were like, hey, you're not supposed to be doing these things. He went back and he kept doing it for literal years. He just kept posting videos and basically ignoring them, uh, which the federal government tends not to like that. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Like, should the things he was doing be illegal or not? Like, it, that's not, rel you know, we're not going to take a position on that for the sake of this story. But what happened, you can go watch his videos. You could decide if you think he's a bonehead, if you think he's putting people in danger, if you think the things he's doing are perfectly safe. But um, he ignored the fines long enough that now they have passed it on to the Justice Department and he is being sued by the federal government. And this is the actual complaint against him. Uh, and I think this is interesting because I believe this is the first time this has happened. There have been people who got FAA fines before. There have been people who, got, who went to court and fought the FAA. But I think this is the first time that it has gone to the Justice Department to because they want to collect their fines. They say he owes them one hundred and eighty two thousand dollars, one hundred and eighty something thousand dollars for all these fines he racked up. And I think it's pretty interesting uh, just to see the government make this case. Um, like what kind of things do they think he did wrong? What are they concerned about? <sighs> He flew in violation of multiple regulations and under unsafe circumstances. So, like, it's interesting to me that they're focused on the, the regulation violations, but also the unsafe circumstances, which isn't a surprise for the FAA. Lacking the ability to control the systems. In other words, times when he lost control of the drone, they're like, hmm, he, that's not good for you to do. Fog, snow, rain, wind, darkness. <coughs> hmm. That's going to keep happening, by the way. Sorry. Um, so, this is pretty interesting. To me, it's pretty interesting. Uh, a couple of, you know, just court bookkeeping stuff showing that they have jurisdiction. Factual allegations. I believe these dates are times when he live streamed. If I remember correctly, they went through his channel and they found his live streams because he would live stream and he would show the the phone screen with his live location the date and time and those were the one and he since he was live streaming it was plausibly you know plausible that he was actually the pilot and it was happening actually on this date one of the things the FAA has to do if they're going to they're going to have to demonstrate that that it was that the flight was on a certain date because if the flight was from you know 2016 well there wasn't a part 107 then theoretically so you have to you know you have to verify that um heavy fog while it was snowing while it was raining during a heavy wind advisory heavy fog while it was raining heavy fog so they're very concerned about him not being able to have visibility i suppose during strong winds that's a weird one to me like what who are you to say my drone can't fly during strong winds i don't know in close, the other thing I thought was interesting is they talk about it being operated in close proximity to these buildings, which by itself should not be an issue. You're allowed to fly near buildings, as far as I know. But they talk about it almost striking a building, and they're concerned about that. 
uh, again, near these near these areas. I'm not sure why that's relevant, except for the fact that maybe it was in an area where he shouldn't have been flying in the first place. Yeah, so that was weird to me. But okay. Like, why are they putting these things in the complaint, I guess, if these things are not actually illegal or against the uh, regulation? Uh, and I wonder if a lawyer could be like, well, that doesn't matter. I don't know. He's freaking, he's guilty as sin on so many other counts. It hardly matters. But <clears throat> they noticed that there was a loss of signal and the aircraft landed unexpectedly. Anyway, uh, this is progressing. And the long and short of it is that this guy, uh, Philly Drone Life, Michael D. I don't know how to say that word. Mike, Mike, Philly Drone Life, Philly Mikey. Philly Mikey is uh, effed, effed. We'll try and keep it, we can try and keep it child friendly. He's, he is screwed. Oh yeah, that's the good way to put that. Like this is a, I don't know, man. He's screwed. Like by the time you get to this stage, whoo. The, the the wheels of the government grind slowly, the wheels of justice, if you will. But, boy, when you get to this stage, you are boned. Pay the full amount of the outstanding penalty of $182,000, together with interest from the date of entry of judgment. Jeez. Oh. Off-axis says nothing's going to stop him from making videos and flying. I mean... Now that he's on the radar, they're going to keep coming after him until he complies. Mm. It is, uh, it's interesting. Um, so, uh, I don't know what to tell you, kids. Uh, I don't know what to tell you, but this is how bad it could get if you rise to the level that the FAA notices you and then you continue to egregiously ignore them telling you, please don't do this. Like, you know, don't do that. Um, yeah. Like, is it plausible at some point? I don't know. Could, could he go to, could he go like go to jail, go to prison over this? It's a civil suit. He hasn't, he isn't charged with a crime yet. I don't know. They could certainly just sue him until he has nothing less. Anyway, there you go, guys. Um, let's see here. How can he pay that if he has nothing? Well, Elmo Hawk, that's not how it works. If the government finds you a certain amount of money and you don't have that money, the government doesn't go, oh, shucks. I mean, there is such a thing as what they call it judgment proof, where you get a judgment against you and there's no way for you to pay it. And so, like, big deal. Um, but like the government just doesn't just go, oh, shucks, you got us. I guess it's not like a free, I, I have no money so I can just keep breaking the rules forever. And it doesn't matter if I get fined. The government wants you to stop doing this. And if charging you fines doesn't make you stop doing it, they will try to find other ways to do it. Uh, anyway, uh, it sucks for him. It sucks for him. It sucks for him that it's come to this. Uh, I will, I guess I will say, I, I don't, I don't like a lot of his flights. I wouldn't have made them. Um, I don't care too much about snow or rain, but I do care about flying over people. And I care about flying in controlled airspace, which he's accused of doing. Uh, those things are over my personal line, obviously. Um, but uh, it absolutely sucks because basically this is life ruining money. And uh, if you ask, is it worth ruining someone's life for the things he did? I don't think the answer to that is justifiably yes, even though he has absolutely been a complete bonehead in the way that he's handled this. So both of those things can be true. <clears throat> okay, well, uh, let's take a look at some questions. Uh, Bolenti's got them queued up. Uh, let's see here. Uh, is a heat sink vital to the performance of an ESC? Mm, yes and no. No, I wouldn't say it's vital. A uh, heat sink will, I mean, fundamentally, the amp limit of a FET, of an ESC, 
uh, relates to heat dissipation more than anything else. The more you can move heat out of the circuit board and away from the FETs, the more amps can flow through the ESC without the ESC being damaged. So when you see a 40 or a 50 or a 60 amp ESC, uh, well, first of all, some of that's just marketing BS. They're just making up numbers. But some of that is them, the, the FETs might be the exact same design, but they have more uh, a better heat a better thermal characteristics due to a heat sink. So heat sink is not absolutely vital. There are many good ESCs that don't have them, but you'll get a higher amp rating with a heat sink that helps move that heat out of there. So what's the best sub 250 gram FPV wing? I'm gonna give you two choices. Uh, I think it's, yes, so and I, I say this, by the way, as someone who doesn't regularly fly wings, okay? But I keep my ear to the ground, and I've heard, I hear things. And so I'm going to recommend to you this, the Strix Goblin. Uh, is it sub-250? I, th I think it must be. If it's not, well, I guess I shouldn't say that. Is it sub-250? Is the Strix Goblin on? Dang it, it doesn't have a weight technical info. Here we go. Please. That's not helpful. Shipping weight doesn't freaking matter. Uh, is it sub 250? Can anyone tell me? Like it doesn't look that big and heavy, but I guess I don't know. The goblin is not sub 250. Oh, it's the nano goblin. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's what I was looking for. I really appreciate the, the tip there. What's the matter? The Strix Nano Goblin. This is the Sub-250 version. And, and many, many people just rave about how good this is. Uh, well, they certainly rave about the original Goblin. I don't know about the Nano Goblin, but I think it absolutely is worth a look. Um, the other thing I would say is didn't... Um, Didn't RC Test Flight make a wing? Who, who, uh, like, uh, yeah, this is it. RC Test Flight, uh, f crowdfunded, I believe, this wing. And I, uh, it, it I, probably is good because he makes good shit, but I don't know specifics about it did the kickstarter surely the kickstarter got funded and again is it sub 250 i think it is but i'm not sure <laughs> oh my god <laughs> okay well it was certainly popular so i would look at these two things okay is it sub 250 i would look at the nano goblin and then i would look at this mini fpv airframe kit from rc test flight Ah, here we go. Thank you very much, Kevin Sumner, for the link. Here's where you can order it from alightwing.com. I'll put links to both of those in the chat. Excuse me. Uh, the, of those, the Nano Goblin is the safe choice. The Nano Goblin's been around forever, has a great pedigree, a great reputation, and it's just, mwah, like, that's the safe choice. The Flick is made by Daniel Riley, uh, and, and, uh, who else? And Think Flight and Daniel Riley makes amazingly good stuff. So I, it's possible, you know, just based and, on his reputation, you might want it. But uh, I don't know if it is as proven as the Nano Goblin. So, yeah, there we go. Um, let's see here. What's the fastest way to learn Matty Flip? How should I know how fast to do the moves and where the ground is? Okay, so Mark FPV, I'm not going to... I'm tempted, very briefly tempted to pull up a simulator and like show it to you. Um, but I, I'm not going to do that. It would take too long. Here's how I teach Matty Flips when I teach them. And I, I say this as someone for whom the Matty Flip is not a staple in my repertoire. Okay? But like my theory is that if I there's someone who doesn't know how to Matty flip at all, and I'm like a a four out of ten on the ability to Matty flip, I can take them from zero to like a three and a half, and then it's all on you, right? At that point, 
The way I teach people to Matty flip is first find just like a, a horizontal bar, some horizontal obstacle that you can pass over and under. It should be relatively high off the ground, okay? So like a carport off the front of a school or a bank, not like imagine that, something that is tall enough to drive a car under if possible. It could be something like a soccer goal if the soccer goal didn't have a net, okay? Something like that. Fly over it. Do a flip forward. Finish the flip and then drop, lean back and go backward underneath it, okay? Break, so what I'm doing here is I'm breaking the move down into its constituent parts, but I'm not gonna try and string all those parts together yet. I'm just getting you to kind of feel your fingers what the move is. So fly over the obstacle, flip, drop, go backwards underneath it. And that's gonna start getting you the visual on what, what it looks like when you drop and go back. This is easiest to do if you have something to look at. If you're out in a soccer field and you're just looking at the sky and the horizon, then when you drop and go back, you don't have a visual reference. So ideally you would do this like there would be something in front of you, or maybe you would be undercover, like you'd be in a car park perhaps, although a car park's gonna be a little bit tight, but something that you can see so you have a visual reference when you drop and pitch back to go back underneath. Start to get a feel for that. Get a feel for how far you pitch back and what it looks like when you're going back under the object, okay? And then start putting that together. Fly over, flip, and try and end the flip, not flat, but at that angle, okay? So I'm gonna fly over it, flip and stop at this angle so I can then just go backwards immediately, okay? And then you're gonna start, but now we, we've taken out the, the dip, the drop. So now we could even do this on the ground. We could just fly, flip, end right here and go backwards. Fly, flip, end right here and go backwards. And then start putting it together. You flip forward, you drop down, you end at that angle, and you go backwards. And that is how I sort of put it together. Okay. Um, do the DJI Goggles 2 have a changeable font on Betaflight? No, they do not. Lively chap. I'm 99% sure they don't. Uh, the V2 goggles do with WTFOS and the HD0 and the Walksail goggles do, but I'm 99% sure the goggles too don't. Um, Igao points out, you don't even need to flip at first. You just drop and lean back. Yeah, I'm fine with that. You just fly over, drop, and fly back. You don't even do the flip. I like to put the flip in, but, you know, I could see it both ways. Igo says you want something much higher than a soccer goal. Yeah. Well, maybe. <coughs> um, okay, we're coming up on the half hour mark, and so it is time. Jeez, we have 31 questions queued, but it's time to get the Super Chats. We're gonna start doing super chats and we're gonna keep doing them until we get done with all of them. And I have to start with this 6969, thank you very much. Uh, super chat from Peace and Love FPV. I appreciate you sharing your choice of level mode for whoop racing. Well, uh, I wanna be clear. It's not that I think level mode is better. It's just, I am not good enough to do these tight, tight micro courses in acro mode. I would, and the fastest pilots all use acro mode is my understanding. So, but I'm just not the fastest pilot. Have you or Blunty ever given level race mode a chance? Acro on the pitch axis, self-leveling on the roll axis. Some racers use it. Uh, I have not. Blunty, have you? No, it feels like that would be the worst part of both parts for me. I, mean, I, I like, hear like, that. I, if I'm falling down, I'm falling on the pitch axis. Like, if I'm in acro and I'm not right, like, to me, yeah. maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I need to try it. But, like, you know, I, I when I did whoop acro, I just learned whoop acro. Because, uh, yeah. to me, it's, like, a different beast. And maybe level races some in between on that. But, like, yeah. 
acro feels very different than angle mode on a whoop because the whoop doesn't have enough power to really save itself like a five inch does you just thrust out of everything yeah. like you're on a little track and you need to yeah. like control yourself on acro so uh yeah i don't know for me it's very yeah. like mode switch in my head like acro to level you know yeah i i mean obviously you get used to it like clearly right. I, i'll say this if i was thinking about this while i was doing race gal uh this week i started participating in a, a rate a, racing format called race gal it's a tiny whip racing format you race at home you upload dvr of the tr of your, you're running the track and then you get prizes based on your times well i won't get prizes based on my times but i you know i'm having a good time um i'm i'm, I'm probably about middle of the pack uh and uh but i wouldn't accept prizes even if i did win them just because obviously that's not anyway that's not the point um i'll say that one of the hardest things for me about flying in angle mode is having to hold forward while I'm trying to turn, right? And I actually will trim my accelerometer pitch forward a little bit so that when it takes off, it immediately starts going forward. And the exact amount is a matter of feel. It's not like all the way. I'm still holding forward on the stick a little bit but it means that I don't have to hold forward on the stick as much, and it feels like I have better control of the roll axis that way. What they're describing here seems like it would let you take off, establish that sort of acro uh, pitch angle, and then still steer angle mode in the turns. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's worth a try. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. Peace and love, FPV, for the donation. Uh, do you think the Remix V2 would break easier? Asks Bulldog FPV. Break easier than what? The Remix V1? I haven't even looked at the... How old was the Remix V2? Oh, this is Umagod's Remix V2. He's released a V2 of the Remix. When did that come out? When did it come out is the first question. Like, how old is it? I mean, I wasn't aware that many people were still flying the Remix. Not that it's bad. It's just a little weird, and I don't see it very often. Obviously, Tommy flies it. It's his frame. It looks like it's uh, from 2019. Oh, well, that was a long time ago. Okay. Remix V2. Thank you for looking that up. Um, Countersunk Hardware... That's going to, I mean, it countersunk. So it was the case that the Remix had press, had um, countersunk washers, which I think makes it stronger because you have more contact area with the carbon. By countersinking the screws like this, I don't think there's any question that it makes it weaker. And I don't want to sound like I'm specifically criticizing this frame because I don't know, I don't know, there's, you know, like, I don't want to pick on this frame. I don't know, I'm just making stuff up from a picture on the internet. But I can tell you that in general, if you think about it, let's say that this is two millimeter carbon, but then you countersink it. So now, like right here, we've got two millimeters of full thickness carbon. But then as we go down, the carbon is thinner and thinner because we've milled it away. And so like this area right here seems like it would be quite prone to breaking potentially, and it will be more prone to breaking if it's countersunk versus if it's not. Uh, that's, uh, that's my experience with frames. Maybe that's what you're asking about. Uh, so, 5 millimeter arms now standard. So the thing is, uh, like, sure, 5 millimeter arms makes sense. You, but the thicker you make the arms, the more you move the stress over into the arm mounting. So if you had four millimeter arms, then maybe the arms break in a crash. But then you go to five millimeter arms and maybe the arms don't break, but now the top plate breaks. And especially like this to me, and again, I wanna be really clear that I'm just shooting off my mouth while looking at a picture on the internet and Tommy Tabahia is an actual frame designer who has tested and put thought into this. And so please take this as nothing more than that. But like when I look at this, this to me is like, oof, that is not a lot of carbon right there. It feels to me like that's potentially some, some place where 
we might see a break. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. <coughs> so, uh, the other, it, I think it takes away some of the character of the frame too. The original frame, like the pre, the aluminum, the countersunk washers were, like, I'm sure that I complained about them at the time because I don't like a non-standard parts and countersunk washers are not really in my toolkit, but like they definitely gave it a real character and a real uh, uniqueness. What have been the trends of power connectors? Asks Socks and Rocks. Thank you for $2. Uh, in FPV, it's been the XT60 as long as I can remember. Now, I know that there's other connectors like the Dean's connector or the uh, EMC, I think, connector or whatever, but it's just been XT60s and XT90s and XT30s pretty much as long as I can remember. Uh, in Whoops, we've had some trends. Maybe that's what you're asking about. In Tiny Whoops, we've gone from the PH connector to the BT connector. And now we've got the new, what is it, the AH30, which might be taken over. But the BT is kind of the standard right now. <laughs> nice try, Mupshot. <laughs> it's just a joke. It's just a joke. Take it easy. Take it easy. You have to be in the Discord server to get that joke. Um, uh, Igal says that with about 13 hours left until the deadline, I'm at about position 80 out of 130. I would like to be better, but uh, 80 out of 130 is 61%. Damn! <coughs> Excuse me. I would like to be higher than that. That's, I'm, I'm well below the halfway mark. I would like to be better than average, and I definitely am not. But I'll tell you, I I worked hard. I worked hard to try and get my times down. My absolute best, given it all I got and, and got lucky and everything went my way, my absolute best time was a 10-6. And I think I got two 10-8s. And everything else was 11 or higher. So like 33... Like, if I worked and worked and worked on that track, 33 is the best I'm going to do, at least this week. And I didn't, that's not the time I submitted. Uh, I think the time I submitted was like a 34. So, like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not embarrassed with that. Like, I put, I put that up and I was like, this guy, like, this guy clear, like, there are some, uh, I'm not going to name names, but there are some uh, YouTubers who don't make a lot of FPV content. They mostly make other types of content. And then occasionally they review an FPV drone. And when they do it, it's clear that they like don't fly FPV a lot and they kind of suck at flying FPV. And that's okay. Like when I put that, that track up, I was like, yeah, all right. I'm not embarrassed of this. Like I've never been, a, a, you know, like a gold, gold tier top pilot. I've never claimed to be. I like to think I'm above average, but if I'm position 80 out of 130 on race Gow, then I am, well, I'm probably above average in like the world, <laughs> but I'm not above average among the race scout contenders. So, yeah, what are you going to do? Siati says the extra five to six grams. Okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Siati, Siati, and, and don't, say no if you want to. You don't have to say it on the stream. Just just ignore me. Siati, send, send me a whoop. L lend it to me. I'll send it back to you. Siati, send me the best whoop you could possibly build, and I will fly it for one week on iGAO, and I will cross-check it against whatever I'm flying at the time. I will put in... See, that's the thing. The, the timer doesn't lie. I will put in my best possible laps on my, my whoop, and then I'll put in my best possible laps on your whoop, and we'll see if I get faster. If you're down, I'm down. Okay. Yeah. The thing is, Siati, I went from the Mobulus, uh, I went from the Meteor 65 Pro, which you and I both agree is kind of heavy and kind of slushy. Like, I, I didn't love the way it flew, but I was like, whatever, maybe I suck. And I went to the Meteor, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. I'm sorry, guys, it's going to keep happening. I went to the Mobulus 6 HD with HD0. And immediately the turns felt sharper. Like I just felt so much more in control. 
And Ciotti was like, yeah, the Meteor 65 Pro is, is kind of big and heavy and handles badly. But here's the thing. My times got about three seconds faster. But how much of that was because I kept practicing? Okay? So, like, it was a little faster. It was at most 10% faster. So that's not going to get me from 11 seconds down to 6 seconds, right? <laughs> Did you tune the Meteor Pro? No. No, I didn't tune it. Beta FPV tuned it. I did try. So actually, that's not even true. I tried tuning it. I tried raising the master multiplier. I tried a few things. I tried raising uh, a feed forward a little bit. I tried very, uh, you know, I didn't like do a full from scratch tune, but I did try to sharpen up the tuning. I also tried raising the angle strength since I was flying in angle mode. And... I got it to the point where it was damn near about to blah, 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 fly away. And I was like, well, I guess I can't tune it anymore. Uh, and uh, it still didn't make me much faster. So. Uh, apparently, Evan Turner has a 200. See, so that's the thing. I can make this. About a week ago, Charles and I went to go have a fun Monday night flying Tiny Whoops in a classroom, and the video went crazy. Everyone's saying, how do you build a drone like that? Where are the parts? Can you buy this ready to fly? How did you do that? Blah, 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 blah. And I wanted to show you exactly that. Charles is here. Look how fast this SOB is. Michael says they're only one second slower with a six gram difference on the whoop. Yeah, I believe it. Because I, I think I think here's the thing, if I was a an S tier pilot, that six gram difference would hold me back, but I am like a C tier or maybe on a good day a B tier pilot, and so it's my own ability, not the handling of the drone, that's holding me back. That's my opinion. Uh, so I may I may use this as an excuse to like get some different tiny whoops and try them out and see if they make me faster. As long as I'm racing, I may as well make content. Anyway. Um, let's continue with the Super Chats. Siati, if you want to take me up with that, DM me. <coughs> DM me and um, I'll, I'll, I'll send it back to you in whatever condition it's in. Nice FPV wants me to play the... Uh, Okay, nice FPV. So I, I instead of playing it on the stream, I posted it. I posted it in in, in the chat, and I will. Uh, I will no, not the message link. Copy link. Copy link. Oh, all right, fine. Here it is. Uh, nice FPV. Thank you for that donation. No, no, please, God, no. Thank you. Say so Eric Ashner does not want to hear the remix of me playing singing "Lose Yourself." Well, good, because we're not going to do that. Uh, Socks and Rocks wants to know, do you and Mr. Steel still have beef? Uh, did we... Did I ever have beef with him? Bloody, did I ever have beef with Mr. Steel? Was there, Do we have an incident? I can't remember. I mean, we've talked shit about how dumb he sounds sometimes on the stream before. <laughs> Ow, woo, woo. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't have put it that way. I have, I'm happy to put it that way. Well, that's why you're here, because you can be the bad <laughs> cop and I can be the good cop. He, he used to make shit up all the time. I haven't heard him do it in a long time. But he would just get on and say stuff that wasn't true. Like one time he said Tracer has a different thing when you set different packet rates. Like a di different latency. He just made it up because he felt Tracer, it. And then Trap Tracer, like, that's not Tracer, true. Tracer doesn't have different packet rates, does it? Or power. He was saying some setting he changed and the Tracer changed the latency. Yeah, and okay. Trap, he's like, that's absolutely not true. And he convinced like yeah. a thousand people it was true because he said it in a video like it was true. You know, yeah. he showed Chris Rosser's frame without actually flying it. Like there's a bunch of stuff we've talked about that he's done that seems yeah. really dumb. And he hasn't done that in a while. So we haven't talked about it in a while. I feel like he's been below the radar. Like I haven't, I mean, I don't know if he's like, I had to look at his channel and was like, uh, you know, is he posting? And he is. I haven't seen a lot of it though. Let's see here, Mr. Steel FPV uh, videos. <clears throat> Talking about his experience at Everest. Shot dissection. I get the impression he's not doing as much freestyle. That he's doing a lot of sort of cinematic stuff, and who knows what else. But. Uh, yeah, see, look at all—all all this content is like cinematic and sports stuff. 
And that seems to be where he's at. It does feel like he's been, you know, we've got this review of the ethics chesty. I felt like this could have been edited a little bit. Like, it's a 24 minute, 24 minutes. I mean, I do long reviews. I feel like there was a longer review. I don't know. I do long reviews. That's only fair. 24 minutes isn't that long. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know that I would say we've ever had beef. There have been times where I've been critical of some of the things he's done. Um, there have been times when I have reviewed his, some of his products, perhaps in a less than, you know, enthusiastic or less than favorable way. Uh, but I mean, I, we've always been cordial. Uh, and uh, just recently he DM'd me <laughs> and was like, he, he was joking that he was sad that he didn't get called out by Bachrinder so he could get in on the drone camps drama. So like he just reached out to me and be like, oh, you know, well, this drama's going on and kind of like just made a joke about it. So I guess we're on good terms. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Senor Drone, for the 249 euros for the uh, intro. Thank you so much. Uh, Gray Hat wants to know, why does half pitch and half roll separately put you looking backwards, upright, but the same amount diagonal input doesn't? Uh, Gray Hat, that depends entirely on your rates, right? Your rates are a function of speed and time. And so if you had equal rates, then equal amount of pitch and roll should diagonally tilt you. Yeah. Hang on, I'll get a drone. Get to, uh, demo this. I guess... Here we go. So... So, equal amount. So, we're, we're going to go diagonally, right? And we're going to end up here. And if we keep going, that's a 180 with equal amounts of pitch and roll. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. We end up upside down facing the other way. Oh, because 360. Because 360, dude. 360. When you do 180 pitch and 180 roll, you have rotated 360 degrees. Okay. So if I were to do 45 degrees pitch and roll, I would go 180, 360. I'd come back facing the same way. Well, I, that's interesting. Go 180, 180, and I'm facing the other way. But if I go at the same time, oh, that's... You know why? I've, I've actually been through this before. And it's because rotations are not commutative. In other words, when you're doing rotations, order matters. So if I do, it turns out that if I do a 180 and a 180, it comes out the same. I've, I've been through this before working on like yaw turns. 180, 180, 180 versus 180, 180, 180. Yeah, the short answer is that order matters when you're doing rotations. <coughs> rotations are not commutative. commutative. And if you don't believe me, you can... Uh, Rotations in three-dimensional space are not commutative. So the order in which rotations are applied is important even if you're rotating all about the same point. So rotations in two dimensions are commutative, but rotations in three dimensions are not. And that's why if you do the pitch and roll at the same time, you end up in a different place than if you do them sequentially. I hope that's a good enough answer because I can't. Why aren't they commutative? Ah! <laughs> uh, Abdullah Luta, music video edits. Thank you for a 25 AED and 7 AED. Let's just check if you have a question. He wants to know, I have drones. I'm really scared of using them because of the paranoia of the gov. I mean, I don't know what to tell you, man. Uh, assuming you're in the USA, 
which, you know, with a name like Abdullah, maybe you're not. I don't know. I don't want to presume. There's lots of Abdullahs in the USA, I'm sure. There's also lots of Abdullahs elsewhere. But assuming you're in the USA, as long as you don't, as long as you are flying in an out of the way area and not flying in a dangerous or reckless manner, then, uh, and you're not posting stuff on the internet to bring attention to yourself, it, it should be relatively easy to fly and not have to worry too much about the government. That's the situation as it stands right now. And there are people who are, who are like, no, I don't accept that. And that's cool. Like, there's always going to be people out there who want to, you know, like, like Greta Thunberg goes and gets herself arrested. Please. I know that she's a polarizing figure. It's just who came to mind. And I don't want any comments in chat about whether you like or dislike her. That's not where we're going here. But my point is that there are sometimes polarizing figures who decide to be a lightning rod uh, and they intentionally get themselves dinged for something that they consider unjust and they use that as an example. And maybe you want to be that guy. You're like, no, I don't accept this. I'm going to go. I'm going to, I'm going to sit myself on the courthouse stairs and I'm going to get arrested. And Okay, fine. Um, there's other people who just want to fly and they want to do that without getting in trouble. And so for them, maybe flying under the radar is, is the right thing, uh, the right decision for them to make. Um, so I don't think you need to be paranoid about the government. In general, you have to try really hard to get noticed and really hard to get fined. But there is a chance that it turns out being you, especially if you do something dumb like fly over a military base or a government building or an airport or a sports stadium. Yeah, so you got to make that decision for yourself. Um, Bro Wild wants to know, is your Mustang stock? And if not, what mods have you done? Uh, good question. Thank you for a $10 donation, Bro Wild. Let me see if I can... Help you with that. Maybe. Uh, no. No, apparently I can't. Uh, albums. What about my albums? Is it, there an album? Yeah. <coughs> Here we go. I found it. So, uh, the stock. So my Mustang is a, uh, is a, is a turbocharged inline four. It is not the V8. Uh, you know, which uh, oh, it always disappoints some people, but that's okay. Uh, and the weak point on the stock Mustang is the intercooler. Look at the difference in the intercooler. This is the stock intercooler. This is the one I put on. Well, I I didn't put it on. This guy right here, his name's Brian. He did 90% of the work. And this guy right here, his friend, his name's Jason. They're both friends of mine. He... Uh, did a little bit of the work, but mostly stood there and criticized Brian for doing it wrong while Brian went under the car and did most of the actual work. That's pretty much sums up their relationship in a lot of ways. Uh, but um, uh, so the car has a uh, an upgraded intercooler, downpipe, uh, charge pipes, and uh, basically everything back to the, the exhaust. But I didn't want to do an aftermarket exhaust because I, I don't like this loud aftermarket exhaust, especially on a four cylinder. Uh, and it's got a tune on it. It's got a tune on it. Uh, Jake says it's sacrilegious to have a four banger Mustang. I know. I know people feel that way. It's a freaking amazing car. I'm sorry. Like it feel free to take the name Mustang off it and call it uh, whatever else you want. It's a freaking amazing car. I really love it. Um, uh, I think it's got like a, a 4.8 or a 4.6 zero to 60. Can't remember. I mean, that 0.2 seconds is, is pretty significant. It's definitely a sub five seconds, zero to 60. Last I checked. Um, so yeah, a turbo and a turbo inline four is a, is a really fun little engine. It's got, uh, enough horsepower to break the end loose for sure. Uh, so funny you say that fork bomb says it could be a Dodge neon actually way back in the day, Jason drove a souped up neon, uh, that was according to him would, would smoke damn near anything on the road. So, uh, now he drives a Genesis G70 though. So, uh, you know, he's gotten older. <laughs> um, 
anyway, uh, that's my car. Actually, uh, I'm thinking about getting it retuned. It's got a it's got an off the shelf tune on it now, and I'm thinking about getting it actually like tuned uh, to see get it get a little more performance out of it. But it costs like five hundred bucks, three maybe three hundred bucks to get it tuned. So I'm not sure it's worth. I mean, <coughs> here's the thing, Grom. I'm not going to argue about my car for very long. We're gonna we're gonna move on. But Grom Drone says I disagree. It's not an amazing car. Yeah, obviously, you know, it's it's subjective. You can have your opinion. If I were to put you in the car and dr take you on like an autocross drive or, or a little mountain road, and not tell you it was a Mustang, right? Like somehow I'm gonna prevent you from knowing what car you're in, and you're just gonna drive it. You'd be like, oh, that's a pretty good car. And then you'd get out and you'd be like, wait, this is a Mustang? Ah, sacrilege, no! Right? The cognitive dissonance would just, you know, you just shrivel up and die. The, the, the V8 Mustang is an amazing car, an iconic car, absolutely. Uh, this car is a very good car. It's just got Mustang badging, which people don't like. But I like it. I think it's a good looking car. And it drives real nice. And if you've never driven in like an S550 uh, EcoBoost, I think you may not understand what it can do. Anyway. Uh, but, you know, whatever. It's not a V8. It'll never be a V8. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. Here's what a loser I am. And I, I, I say this. And I'm putting this out there on the internet. And all the people who already don't like me are going to clip this and use it as an example of why I'm a loser. So I want to preface it by saying I fully understand the context. I am comfortable with my own self and I know my strengths and my weaknesses and I am not ashamed of this. I've dr test drove the V8 and I sat in the V8 and I started it up and <laughs> And I was like, oh, yeah, oh, oh, shit. You know, that's the reason you buy the V8. And I took it on the test drive. And over the course of like an eight-minute test drive, I was I went from being like, oh, yeah, to being like, it's kind of loud. And I thought if I were to do like a three-hour or six-hour road trip with this freaking V8 <laughs> in my freaking ears the whole time, uh, I'd be like, nah. Forget it. It, it wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. That if, that's a, if I were to take it to the track or something, sure. But if I was to just go on an eight-hour road trip, which I, I do several times a year, it would drive me crazy. Anyway. <clears throat> Tulio says, thank you for $5. Tulio, I'm really new to FPV and tuning a speed to be Master 5 V2 I've built. My P gain is best at 125. I'm worried that's way higher than it's normal. Nah, that's not that high at all, man. 1.3? That's like nothing. Like, the Betaflight default PIDs are extremely conservative. I've seen people go up to 1415, you know, and maybe even higher, but probably not higher than about 15. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. Like, you, like, I'd like to know why you're that high. But 125 doesn't even bat an eye. Um, there was a time when on pretty much every build I made, the first thing I did was turn the master plot multiplier up to 1.2 or 1.3. Yeah. I'll tell you, though. Like, I'd consider, if I had, like, all the money in the world... In other words, not just the money to buy the car, but also the money to maintain it and pay for gas and all that shit. I the freaking the freaking Mach One Mustang is such a good such a good car. Like the um, the GT three fifty, such a good car. Like they're just exceptional cars. Um, I still don't know if I would like get sick of that noise, but. They're, they're exceptional cars. Anyway. Um, is there a difference, asks Adrian CP, thank you for $10, between a T versus a barred pole antenna? Yes. One's a T, one's a barred pole. You're welcome. <laughs> um, what's the difference? I don't know. 
<clears throat> oh my god. Oh, it's getting worse. It's because I'm talking for hours and hours. I'm sorry, guys. Um, it's a planar bazooka dipole. What the frick is a barred pole antenna? It's an end-fed dipole. Okay, so the uh, Immortal T is a dipole. And this is, it's a center-fed dipole, though. So the Immortal T, the feed line comes up, and then the two elements come out, and it's a center-fed dipole. This is an end-fed dipole. But what is it? Oh, and the key is that it uses a PCB. That's the difference. So the idea is that since it's a PCB, it's going to be more durable. More durable than a wire? All right. In terms of performance, I just don't know. The main advantage... So here's what I'll say. Generally, PCB antennas have worse performance than wire antennas because the uh, the dielectric constant, the impedance of the PCB is not correct. And there's nothing you can really do to change that. What you have to do is you have to change the thickness of the PCB, but that's not that's not always an option. So a lot of times the efficiency of a PCB antenna will be significantly lower than a wire antenna, which means that you'll get less energy coming out of the antenna and means the antenna has worse performance. Uh, so in general, I would avoid a PCB antenna unless there was a compelling reason to go that way. Yeah, I think you should stick with the, the standard Immortal T. And that, that brings us to the end of the super chats and back to the regular chats. Thank you to everybody who super chatted. And we are going to pick up where we left off with the regular chats. Um, let's see what we got here. Tech Giant asks, does the milliwatt rating of the ELRS transmit module play a role in the range the drone can cover? I'm using the jumper T light and I can't get my drone to go very far. Uh, yes, absolutely. The, uh, the output power is one of the main things that determines the range that the drone will go. In general, four times the power gives 2x the range, all else being equal. You can memorize that number. And then when you think about, well, I went from 250 milliwatts to 500 watts. How much range is that? Well, actually, a doubling of power gives you 1.4 times the range. These are two ratios that you will just learn if you work with antennas and RF long enough. Doubling of power is 1.4 times the range. It's the square root of 2, if you're interested. And a quadrupling of power gives 2x the range. It's the square root of 4, if you're interested. And if you're really mathematically inclined, you could figure out any other ratio, if you so desired. It's the square root of the... Anyway. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, yes, uh, if you're not getting enough range, though, uh, like you should still be able to go uh, like t kilometers on 25 milliwatts under ideal conditions. So uh, there is a test you can do. There's a test you can do. Uh, it's called the table test. And it is used here. It is the bench test. And it is used to just basically sanity check the your antennas and so forth. Uh, and I'll give you a link right here in chat to the bench test. And if you don't pass the bench test, something is wrong, usually with your antennas, but not always. Okay. Thank you, Tech Giant, for that question. Um... Uh, why could a one watt analog VTX interfere with a GPS unit? Uh, there are two reasons. Uh, whoa, and we switched to DJI 03 and boom, 27 sats. Well, that's interesting. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that digital VTXs output significantly less power than analog VTXs. Um, with analog VTXs, the, let's say you've got a, a one watt analog VTX. The power is being measured going into the antenna. That's the standard for analog VTXs. Uh, and that means that the VTX puts out one watt, it goes into the antenna. Maybe the antenna is a 3 dB antenna, just to keep the math simple for me. 
uh, and that that causes a doubling of power, which gives you two watts coming out of the antenna. But the DJI, all the digital video transmitters output, they measure their power coming out of the antenna. So a one watt DJI VTX is actually outputting only say 500 milliwatts or maybe even less. And then that goes into the antenna. The antenna has some gain and it makes it. So you actually have less energy coming out of a digital VTX and maybe that was it. The other thing to keep in mind is that analog VTXs, they're, they're not very well made usually. And so for the, the DJI uh, air unit has to pass FCC certification and it has to like part 15 certification, which to be fair is, uh, you know, one of the things for part 15 certification is this device cannot cause interference to license transmitters and must accept interference if it, if it is occurring. And so uh, I would wager a bet that the DJI air unit has less RF emissions than an analog video transmitter. These are some reasons why you might have had this experience. <coughs> but um, I can't tell you for sure. Uh, Blown Stuff says, I think I blew out the RXTX on my O3 air unit. I wonder if it's going to go to full power without that. It will not it will not go to full power. So there's no way around that with the O3, sadly. It's a shame because with the Vista, you could turn off temperature protection and it would go to full power all the time. But with the O3, there is no way around that. That sucks. Um, can I program EdgeTX to yell the voltage at a certain point? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have an old video. I have an old video about how to do that. Uh, how to make your Tyrannus read out low voltage. I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn. Uh, little, uh, little uh, f tidbit. I'm actually in Maui when I recorded this video. I recorded this in Maui. <coughs> Uh, so that video might help you. The, the process is basically the same with modern stuff. <laughs> um, how do I find abandoned buildings around my area? Yvonne Krostev wants to know, um, Yvonne, uh, if you have a like urban exploration group that you can get hooked up with, there, there are urban exploration groups in many cities. And if you can get hooked up with them, that may help. Personally, I just keep an eye out when I'm driving around. Uh, you know, and you go like, oh, that construction site looks interesting. I could fly there. And then you just go do it. You basically just keep your eyes open and you look around as you're going about your life. Let's see here. Is there an HD FPV camera for low budget? Epsilon Plus. Not, not really. Not really. All of the HD FPV systems, HD Zero, Walksnail, and DJI, come in at a significantly higher price point than the cheapest analog gear. And there, there's no way around that. And I'm waiting. Plenty, are you waiting for the comments? You know what? Don't say it. You know what I'm waiting for in the comments, right? Uh, no. A cheap digital FPV system, Blunty. Oh, you know what they're sure. going to say. Yes, I know what they're going to say. There it is. Just took a second for them to catch up. People are going to point out IPC or uh, open IPC. And, and I... Uh, uh, is that up on the live stream clips channel, Bunty? Um, maybe it must I don't be, think right? so. Didn't why wouldn't it be up? Did it just hasn't gone know. up yet? Maybe it depends on when we talked about it. We talked about it on the news. It will be on the news. It must be. Then no, it didn't go up. Why not? That just wasn't a clip I posted. 
Oh God, I wish you, I mean, maybe it's too late, but I wish you would. Because like, we're going to have this conversation again and again and again. And I'd love to be able to just link to that, that news segment where we were like, F open IPC. It's, a, it's a all hype or more or less. Uh, gotcha. Anyway, uh, let me see if I can find that. Uh, 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 what if I search for IPC? No. Open IPC. No. Oh, I'm on the wrong channel. No, it was my channel. It was the news. Oh, well. Uh, the short version is that Open IPC is very, very much a proof of concept. There is one guy, mostly, who is hyping the shit out of it. And it is still a, not really actually demonstrated to work in the real world. That doesn't mean it won't. It just means that so far there's basically one guy uploading videos where he's like, look how cool this is. And we all know that there's a there's a vast chasm between one guy being like, look how cool this is, and a product that works in the real world. Uh, and Blunty and I are both uh, ca cautiously skeptical and also a little bit annoyed at the hype train. Because Matt's like in the chat said he would eat an O3 if it becomes something people use. He would what? Eat an O3? He would eat an O3 air unit, yeah. Right. The, the, I, I looked into making a tutorial for OpenIPC and the hurdles you have to go through to actually get it working. I was like, I don't care enough to go through this and the number of people who are going to watch this video and follow it are so low that I don't think it's content worth making. Now, it, it keeps getting easier to use, but it is far from an actual usable FPV system, in my opinion. So it's cool. It's cool. But you just see this video of this guy flying it around and you're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, I want it to be all these things. And it's not those things. Never mind that once you get it working, we still don't have real world tests on the range, the latency and so forth. And chances are that it's not just going to be amazing out of the gate, right? Because things usually aren't amazing out of the gate. So the short version is that OpenIPC is an interesting project. It's a cool as shit. It's cool as shit, but it is not an FPV system that can be usable on the daily no matter how determined you are. It is not an alternative to analog, DJI, et cetera, et cetera. It is a, a, a niche project, a cool niche project that one guy is doing. And it's a little bit frustrating. It's, it's understandable that people are looking for a good alternative, but as someone who has to answer questions all the time, it's a little frustrating that so many people think it's so much better than it really is and then get annoyed at me for not making content about it. They're like, why Why won't you? They, they want it to be something that it isn't, and I can't make it be that thing, and then they're mad at me because I don't think it's that thing, and I'm not treating it as that. Anyway, but uh, enough about me. Um, do you expect an Avada successor to soon? Well, the new DJI FPV drone is the next drone that is sort of in that class that's been leaked uh it hasn't come out yet <coughs> but it's strongly expected in the next little while it seems to me that if dji releases a new fpv drone that will slot in where the avada slots in and that we wouldn't see a new avada soon but who knows it's all it's all speculation Uh, bot 51 wants to know what's the best seven inch plus drone to use for flying in the mountains. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Gep RC, the Gep RC, uh, Moz two seven is quite good. The Gep RC, uh, Mark five, seven inch is very, excuse me, very good. Um, I, uh, as you may know, I go sometimes and I do training classes and consulting engagements where I go away for a week or two and I teach people how to fly. Um, and, uh, one of the classes that I did used the, it, it used the GEP RC Cinelog three, two, three Oh, I think. 
as the as the baby beginner drone for the students. And then the final exam involved the uh, Gepperse Mark V 7 inch. By the way, it's super confusing because the Mark V feels like a 5 inch, but it's now it's a 7 inch. And it's because that's actually Mark, v, there was the Mark III, which was an earlier version of the frame. So it's like Rev 5 of the frame. Anyway, it's the Mark V 7 inch, which is quite good. <coughs> The Maz 27 is a little bit like more roomy and a little bit bigger, but the uh, uh, Mark 7 was quite good. The uh, the iFlight, uh, the iFlight Chimera 7 is also quite good. Um, Geparcy has a 10 inch drone for under 400 bucks. I haven't tested that, but in general, Geparcy has a pretty good pedigree in my eyes. Uh, iFlight and Geparcy are two of the leaders in making bind and fly big drones uh, in my eyes. And and just to, to be clear, that's not just based on like you know who I'm shilling for this week. That's based on uh, experience using these drones in the field and to teach and so on. Um, speaking of shilling, ooh, where's he going now? <laughs> speaking of shilling, I would love to share with you guys. And again. Don't click away and watch this video right now. Keep watching my live stream. My analytics need it. But I would love to point out to you guys this video from Pavel Spikowski. Uh, the, uh, he's best known as an iNav developer, or probably the iNav developer. This video, it, it, like you can see, I left a comment. Everything he says in this video is a hundred. <coughs> oh my God. <coughs> I'm so sorry. <coughs> Oh, I hate my life. Ugh. Everything he says in this video is a hundred percent correct, and it's it's. Uh, I I just have I have that experience very seldom, and so I was like, this guy freaking nailed it. Now maybe you're not interested in this topic, but uh, he talks about. Like it ties into the drone cam spot grinder kerfuffle, and and he talks about why being an FPV influencer is kind of like the, the impossible, and all the reasons why it, you know you posting your affiliate links probably isn't going to make you a lot of money. It's very insightful, and I think it's worth ten minutes of your time. Oh, it looks like he replied. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I actually left a comment. I wonder if he's approved my comment. Somebody actually took a shot at me here. I love it. Uh, did he approve my comment? He didn't approve my comment yet. My comment had a link in it. Uh, even JB's viewership has dropped off. You guys can't see this. It's not zoomed in. Oh, that's a little too zoomed in. Even JB's viewership has dropped off. He has resorted to pumping out a bunch of clickbaity, repetitive filler content. And many viewers are upset that he keeps trying to shame people into spending big money on the latest HD gear. Even though it's more subtle, it has turned into a product shilling channel. The fact is that FPV has dropped off in popularity due to regulations. There's some truth to that. Novelty fade. There's some truth to that. And most importantly, high prices, lack of availability for a lot of gear. That sentence is basically right. I have a feeling JB will eventually end up having to get a normal day job, perhaps sooner than later. Ha <laughs> ha, suck it. Um, it's funny because I feel like I've done fewer reviews in the last six months. I've just been a little bit uh, less excited. Here. Just been a little bit less excited about product reviews. Like I find myself looking at some products and going, meh. And then I just like, but and then like on some level, my, 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 I go, but product reviews pay the bills and product reviews are useful. People want to see your product reviews. They want you to help them steer them towards products. And then I go, meh. And then I go make some other type of content. So I'm kind of surprised to hear that, uh, 
that uh, I am I have I have resorted to clickbait repetitive filler content. Like I don't know which of this is filler content. Is it my Learn to Fly series? Like that's my bread and butter is making content for beginners. Filler content. I don't know. Releasing this video in the winter was a terrible choice. Oh. I have a theory about this. What's your, what's your theory, Blunty? I'd love to hear it. He's dumb and doesn't realize that's the Clips channel. <laughs> Oh my god, you're right. I know I'm right cuz I get this complaint all the time. Oh, wow. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Oh my god, I didn't even think of that blunty. See, here's a product review. There's a couple there's product reviews, but like they were product reviews of things I was legitimately interested in. Like I, like for like what stands out to me is I haven't done a, a review of a new bind and fly in like a long time because more and more I look at a bind and fly and I go, eh, who cares? So it's another drone. And the funniest, and I don't know. I, just, I don't know. I think yeah. the funniest part about that is that all your clips are from people asking the questions. So they're literally right. replies to relevant questions that people ask in a thing, often super chats. So yeah. it's like, nobody cares about these things and it's all filler. It's literally what people have asked in chats to find out information about and often ask every week. Yeah. It's like insane. I mean, live live stream clips, if posted to the main channel, I could see you arguing that's filler. Live stream clips are, are in some ways sort of filler content. But it's not filler if it's on its own channel, you know, and it's not taking – anyway. Here's the last uh, Bind and Fly review I did was the Moz 7 five months ago. Before that, the Rotoriot Vision 40. Uh, did, and I did some, uh, yeah. Uh, I haven't reviewed a Bind and Fly in five months. I did a video about Pixhawk because I just wanted to do it and I wanted to branch out. I mean, how could I not review the Goggles X? Anyway. Uh, I did some content about lap timers, mostly because I wanted to learn how to build and use a lap timer. Uh, yeah. Anyway, that's really hilarious. If you go search Joshua Bardwell, you find a bunch of live stream clips, don't you? Let me zoom out here. People also would. I just want to see. You got to skip the. You got to skip the people also watch. They added the stupid people also watch section. If you go under it, 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 it gives you new things again. They just show four yeah, things. Yeah. So here's there. the live stream clips, and you go, ah ha. Yeah. Look at. I'm so sad. I ever put shorts up. Sure. I'm gonna take down all my shorts. Uh, Forty-seven thousand views is not nothing. Uh. Yeah. I see. Oh my God. What is this for you? No. F you. YouTube search sucks now. I don't know if you noticed. Yeah. You know, They're uh, ruining it. it's now like injected with shorts and then things you didn't ask for. And then things from your history that you didn't ask for. And then it's like, yeah. stop, please. You know, TikTok lets you have up to 10 minute videos and they're encouraging people to upload horizontal content. I mean, 10 minutes is still not as much as I would like, but. <clears throat> Anyway, how can the antenna output more power that's going than is going into it? Asks Slinky13. Good question, Slinky. It can't. In fact, due to efficiency losses, it will always output less power that's going into it. But the antenna gain, what it does is it focuses the power. So imagine that I've got one watt going into the antenna, but the antenna, the, 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 an isotropic antenna radiates the energy in a perfect sphere. Okay. There's no such thing as an isotropic antenna in the real world, though. So an isotropic antenna, a, a theoretical thing that doesn't exist in the real world, the one watt of power goes into the isotropic antenna. It, it is broadcast out into a perfect sphere. And that means that at a given distance from the antenna, it doesn't matter where you are around the antenna, you will measure the same amount of energy. And that energy will be one watt divided over the surface area of the antenna of the of the of the sphere that is being projected out from the antenna okay but real antennas focus the signal so imagine a light bulb 
and that light bulb is outputting one watt, and that light bulb is broadcasting into the room, okay? That's your isotropic radiator. Now imagine we take a reflector and we put that reflector around the light bulb so that instead of a light bulb broadcasting in every direction, we have a spotlight. You with me? That's in fact how spotlights work. There's a light and there's a reflector. Well, now we have one watt of power, but more of the power is going over there and less of the power is going over here. And that's the gain of the antenna. That's the gain of the antenna. Uh, Siadi, I am definitely not posting any more shorts, but I did post shorts in the past. Kind of silly. Can I get rid of my shorts? Shorts. Here are A lot of people in chat have asked you not to remove your shorts on the stream. Why do they want, why? I mean, Listen I haven't posted one. Again. Have asked me not to remove my shorts, right? Yes. Yeah, why? What else does shorts mean? Oh, dumb. Let's see. Let's uh, edit, select all my shorts. All videos selected. No, all shorts selected. Jesus Christ. If I... No, 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 no. If I were to accidentally like just nuke my whole channel by trying to delete all my shorts, that would be hilarious. Definitely. No matter what you do, don't delete them. Just put them to private. Or yeah, yeah. No, I'm not going to, but yeah. that would still be hilarious. Okay. Hang on. 41 selected. 41 videos selected. That's all my shorts. Edit. Visibility. Private. I'm about to update 41 videos. 41 videos. I understand the implications of this action. Update videos. Okay, I did it. So I selected all, but I wasn't sure if it selected all videos or all the shorts. I mean, they're all old anyway. They're all from 2022 anyway. Who cares? Yeah. Great. Because they're shorts views, Brandon. They're shorts views. Shorts views aren't valuable. And my content isn't really shorts content. Atreides says, I found this channel from a short. Well, you're the exception, I assure you. Shorts are the number one way to drive views on YouTube right now, Joltek says. Yeah, but they drive views to shorts. They don't drive views to your main channel. That's exactly correct. That's the whole problem. Ask, shorts ask drive any, views to shorts. Yeah. Ask anybody who has tried to, to drive from shorts to long form content. It is wildly unsuccessful. And the other problem is let's if you do have a short that pops off, then you have shorts viewers who come to your long form content and hate it. Because the kind of person who is wants to watch shorts doesn't want to come watch long form content. And I understand that those aren't the same thing. I watch some long form content and I watch some sort of TikTok style content, but I don't watch those things from the same creators. The creators who I watch for long form content don't make compelling short form content. And the creators who I watch for short form content generally don't make compelling long form content. My content is all long form content. I do tutorials, instruction. Can you imagine how, what my videos would look like on TikTok. TikTok style shorts, they don't want educational, like maybe if you gave me a 10 minute, now that TikTok has up to 10 minutes, maybe I could do something useful. But the other thing is that the monetization from short form, from shorts is awful. The, the CPM is awful. You'll get a million views and make a hundred bucks or something. It's awful. There is no justification for me as a creator to participate in shorts. There's no money in it for me. The type of content that, that is successful on shorts is not the type of content that I like to make. And the kind of people who are the type of content that people are looking for on shorts, flip, 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 
flip, flip. Can you imagine your flip, flip, uh, somebody's dancing to a song, somebody's doing a rage bait recipe, and then flip, and here's, you're gonna learn something today. Let me teach you how to set up, let me review a new drone. No, flip, you're gone. There is no, there's no reason for me to, to participate in shorts. The best case scenario if I uploaded shorts would be that a whole bunch of people would fall in love with my shorts and then not want to watch my other content. And because YouTube doesn't make a distinction, it would actually hurt my analytics because they would be shown my long form videos, not like them. And my CPM and my retention would go down and my long form videos would suffer as a result. I don't know that for a fact, but that, that, that tracks to me. So no, we're not doing shorts. The other thing I'll say I've done this personally is it doesn't seem like my shorts gets any recommendations <coughs> or very little recommendations from every, my real video history and my real videos yeah. get very little from my shorts history. Like they kind of like live separately. Like yeah. I'll see totally different shorts well, than I it's see for different... the rest of my main channel recommendation. Uh, I'm, I'm, I would be happy if shorts was a different algorithm, recommendation algorithm, because like well, I said, is, though, you want it different push content. push them to you though, right? Like, cause, but well, if it worked like that, then if they watch your shorts, then they would see your long videos too. And then it would be like, oh, it's all integrated. To me, that's better. But, if, yeah, but in but, this case, but, they'll never get pushed to your long-term content. They'll always Well, what you shorts. can do is you – so what people say in the YouTube community is that you can attach a link to your long-form video in your short. And then theoretically, people will see the short and they'll be tempted and they'll go click the long-form. But that doesn't happen. According to like uh, – I'm, I'm in some YouTube creator, like a Discord server and there's a subreddit. And the people who have tried it, they say that the numbers are abysmal. That the click that it's like, you know, a, a tenth of a percent uh, conversion from the shorts to the long form. So, uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, let's move on. Uh, we got a we got a super chat here from Comic Sniper who asks, I'm having problems with Betaflight not being able to change motor directions happening on multiple quads. Um, there's a bug in 4.4 where 4.4 can't can't do the motor wizard. You can get around it by using BL Heli or by swapping wires. There's no such bug in 4.3 Comic Sniper and I'm not sure why it wouldn't work in 4.3. Uh, but the bug is there in 4.4 and that would explain it. Um... I reviewed this the Phoenix remote ID the other day. Uh, Christopher Concrete wants to know. Thanks for five dollars, Christopher Concrete. Uh, does it need to be connected to a GPS? Yes, a uh, remote ID device needs a GPS so it can broadcast the location of the drone. That's one of the things that's required. The Phoenix MRID connects to an external GPS unit. There are GPS. There are remote ID modules with built-in GPS units as well. It's just a question of which what's going to work best for you. But you do need a GPS for you to sort of be compliant. Robocopter asks, "Have you checked out the ORT helical antennas for the goggles too? They are much better than the stock ones." Thank you for five dollars. Uh, I'm generally not a fan of helical antennas on goggles because they stick out so far. ORT makes okay antennas. Like, I don't have a problem with ORT antennas in general. But, um, <coughs> I mean, these are not as sticky-outy as some helicals. <coughs> oh, God. Are they cross-polarized? I mean, it doesn't matter because the O3 is linear, so left or right doesn't matter. But, like, this idea... That you can get better performance by by having cross polarized antennas. I'm I'm not a fan of it. <coughs> yeah, I could imagine it giving a range boost. I don't know for sure. Uh, it needs it's got 7 dB of gain. Yeah, that's that's probably going to give you a little bit of a range boost. Helicals have very good axial ratio. That's one of the things that stands out for them, and they're not too big. Although they're still kind of big. Yeah. They're 60 bucks. Uh, eh. 
Eh, I can't type today. How much is the true RC? 60 bucks as well. I think they're a little lower profile. Can I get a picture of them on the goggles? No. Can I get a picture of them on the goggles? There we go. That's what I'm looking for. So that's a like maybe a little lower profile, but not that much. Uh, I think that the ORT are probably going to be more efficient. I don't know, because these are not straight PCB patch antennas. These are, um, what's the freaking name for them? Dang, now I'm blanking. It's got two PCBs separated by an air gap, and so it fixes the efficiency problem with uh, with patch antennas. Maybe not. I don't know. I would personally probably take the True RC because it's lower profile. Although, either way, you're going to take the damn things off when you put your goggles away. So, Robocopter says the True RC ones don't compare. Huh. I'm worried about wearing out that MCX connector. Taking the antennas on and off all the time. That thing doesn't have an infinite service life. I just use the stock antennas, personally. Monkey wants to know, is there any three or three and a half inch frame for a 30 millimeter stack and walk snail? Oof. Uh, what about the AOS? The AOS frames uh, usually have pretty roomy mounting. Let's see if they can do a three and th uh, thirty millimeter. Uh, nope, nope, they can't. Okay. Uh, what is a three or three and a half inch frame that can mount a thirty millimeter stack? Oof. Uh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, what about the, um, uh, the three, <coughs> the Flyfish Volador 3 or 3.5? Hello? Hello? What does it mount? What does it mount? Please tell me. Nope. 20 or 20.5. Uh, so that's going to be a no. What about the walk snail? Get the walk snail in the back. How's he gonna, how are you going to do a three and a half inch with a walk snail full size VTX? That's a tough one. It's got 25 in the back. So it could probably fit the walk snail VTX. Okay. That's a, yeah, don't put a... I agree with the chat who are saying don't put a freaking... Don't put a freaking 30 millimeter on a 3 inch anyway. It's a bad idea. Say word. Thank you for a $10 super chat. Just hit my one year mark in FPV and rewarded myself with an 03 in goggles too. And I freaking love it. Any suggestions for a freestyle pilot in the 03 settings? Yeah. Always be running at a, whatever, 100 frames, 120 frames per second. Always be running at the, I think it's 100 frames per second. Except don't run 4K 100 because that 4K 120, that's actually 60 frames per second. Uh, but like run 2.7K 100 and that'll get you the lowest latency. Still not a very low latency, but lower. Okay. Um... And then personally, I like to manually set the channel. Don't auto. If you're flying with a bunch of other people, auto channel is okay. But I like to manually set the channel. Didn't they add 4K 120 to the O3, but it's really 60 FPS? It's 60 FPS to the goggles, but 120 on the, uh, uh, on the, on the DVR. <coughs> What countries have you flown in outside of America? Uh, mostly America. I, where have I been? I don't travel very much. Uh, mostly America. Where else in the world would you like to fly? 
Uh, there's a couple places I would love to fly. Um, I think it would have been really cool to get to fly the Spanish Hospital Bando, made famous by Sharpu and then later Phoenix FPV, which I'm told is now being torn down or has been torn down. That's a cool one. Um, I also ha thought uh, have been really entranced with, uh, I think it's Heath Blackholt. I always get his name, or is it Holt Black Heath? Uh, some of the bandos he flies in look really, really cool. I've said this before. I mean, he's, he's gonna it's gonna become weird because like every time somebody asks this question, I like mention his name and it's gonna sound start sounding creepy. Um, but like those are two things that have jumped out to me in the past that made me go, man, that would be really cool. There's so many cool places to fly though. Like, um, I mostly don't travel though. Certainly not internationally. Certainly not enough to have enough experience to have an opinion about which country is better. Um, Buntroll asks, Bumtroll asks, thank you for six euros. I do wish you start to do more reviews because all the reviews I see are kind of crap and this, this is the best. See, that's the thing. That's the thing. Um, I don't know how to put this. <coughs> I actually thought about doing a video talking about this and I, I hate I hate to do meta commentary where you get on and you're like talk about yourself and your channel because like my my opinion is that my content speaks for itself and it, 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 I feel like a lot of times when content creators talk about their process and I'm not talking about like a like a you know how I make a video behind the scenes that's not what I mean but the content creator gets up and they're like, well, guys, I've been feeling X today. And that's why, you know, this Friday, we're not going to have a live stream. We're going to have a it's like, just do the thing. Let your content speak for itself. And don't like use your audience for therapy. That's not that's we don't we're not having a two way relationship. Right. I make content. I put it out there. You watch the content. Yeah, we talk in the comments and in the discord server, but like. For the most part, it's a one-way relationship where I make the content, you consume the content, you feel a certain way about it. And the problem is that there's 300,000 people watching the content. Well, probably not that many, but that's how many subscribers I have. And so it's impossible to have a relationship with each of them individually or have a relationship with them collectively. So when the YouTuber gets up and they have this like therapy session, that's just you talking to the camera. It's you talking to yourself. There is no reason for you to post that video, right? You're going to post that video and some people will love it and some people will hate it. And you can read the comment section and you could feel validated or you could feel like, you know, did you just t talk to your wife, talk to your best friend, talk to your therapist, talk to your dog. But you don't need to make that video. But I have thought. That like, like a lot of, a, a lot of times I'll get a product for review and I'll be like, I'm just not that interested in this. Like, I just want to go fly or I just want to go build something. Most of the time, I'm not that interested uh, in like, for example, a new bind and fly drone. Like, it's cool. It's a cool drone. But like, I'm like, do I want to like spend it all day reviewing it? Because for me to review it, I want to do a good job. And to do a good job means I really need to, like, understand how it fits in, the pros, the cons. I don't want to just do, like, a shill review where I'm like, eh, it's good, love it. And for me to do a good job requires me to sort of be enthusiastic and to care and to, like, really. And then and then I look at it and I'm like, I don't really care about this. And then, like, I was, sometimes sometimes I'm like, you know what, though? People are counting on you. They want They want your opinion. And then I, I like I kind of like kick myself in the ass and I go do my job because like, you know, if you work construction, you don't get to wake up and be like, I don't feel like you know, going to work today. And everybody will be like, oh, OK, we get it. No, you kick yourself in the ass. So you go do your job. But then like eventually you burn out. That's where burnout comes from, in my opinion. If you don't feel like doing the work and you kick yourself in the ass and you make yourself do the work, especially for a creative it's, you know, eventually that you end up burning yourself out. And I think that's why, like, I haven't done a bind and fly review in the last five months. There have been interesting bind and flies that have come out. I think that some of them are probably sitting over in the closet right now waiting for me to review them. And I've just been like, eh, I don't want to. 
And and sometimes and and I, then I go and you know what? For now, I'm not going to. Today, I'm not going to kick myself in the ass and make myself do the thing I kind of don't want to do. I'm going to build a I'm going to build a lap timer. I'm going to participate in race gal. I'm going to do some crazy tutorial that like ten people will watch, but I'll enjoy. You know, and eventually. I'll be like, oh, shit, my analytics are down. Oh, no, my channel is dying. I have to go back to shilling. And I'll start making, I'll start kicking myself in the ass again and making reviews of of products. But, you know. <coughs> Excuse me. So I get it. I, I, I get it. I, 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 uh, I, uh. I don't take for granted that so many people care about my opinion and my reviews. And miss them when they're not there. I don't take that for granted. But at the same time, there's a balance that needs to be struck between like my my sort of well being and uh and uh my my obligation to my viewers. So and then sometimes, as Igal points out, sometimes those videos that you think are just for you and that won't get a lot of views, but fuck it. Oh, pardon me. Sorry, parents. But F it. I'm going to do it for me. I'm going to make the content I want to make. Sometimes they get pretty good views. Uh, the uh, the race gal video has 15,000 views in uh, three days, which is not bad. It's not shabby. Not too shabby. It's not a barn burner, but it's not too shabby. But there you go. Podcast, thank you for a 14 South African Rand. Is there a sim that's good for practicing line of sight? Ah, uh, not really. Is there? Does anybody know a like there's like Phoenix Real Flight? There's the plane simulators. I don't know. Does anybody in the chat know a sim that's good with a good line of sight mode? Uh, we'll, we'll see. Real Flight Evolution. Uh, we got a question here from Lena Kvyatkovskaya. Lena Kvyatkovskaya, who says, could you please recommend a durable small drone to teach people who never flew before? Uh, Lena, I have taught uh, people uh, on the GEPRC Synalog 3.0, and I was, I'm not going to say that they didn't break, because, like, eventually everything breaks. A particular weak point on those was the antennas they came with. They kind of popped off the end and were, and were breaking, so, like, you're going to want spare antennas. But overall, I was pretty impressed with the durability of the GEPRC Synalog 3.0, um, I would say that like, if you had 10 students, if you bought say 15 of the GEPRC Synalog 3.0, you'd be in a pretty good shape. So, um, yeah. Okay. That's, oh, we got one more super chat. Hey, uh, Fork Tail Devil, thank you. Uh, hey, JBN Blunty, thanks for doing what you do. I'm indecisive on picking a video system for freestyle and maybe racing, but I'm leaning heavily towards Walksnail. What's your current take on the Goggles X? Thank you for $10, Fork Tail Devil. Um, uh, the Goggles X are, are, are a good Walksnail goggle. If you're buying a Walksnail goggle today, I think they are clearly the way forward. You could save a little bit of money by buying the original Dominator goggle from Rotor Riot. Not, not, not like a huge amount of money, but a little bit of money. Um, and it'll get you done. Uh, the Goggles X has a few features like analog input and HDMI input, um, which may be useful to you. I, I think they're an okay buy. There have been some issues with them overheating. Not everybody had that issue, but many people did. Um, they have a new heat sink that's supposed to fix it. And uh, so like they're going through some growing pains, kind of, I'm sorry, I keep hitting the microphone, kind of as we knew they would. But in general, I think that the Goggles X is is probably a safe buy for most people today. Um, and Walksnail is one of the best systems for a mixture of freestyle and racing. 
uh, because it has the racing mode where it has absolute crap video quality, but the latency is pretty consistent. Uh... Oh, yay! 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 <laughs> I'm so happy to see that. Uh, Lana says I did an okay job spelling uh, their last name. Uh... I tried, I tried, uh, to, so I, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but my editor, Fabio, you, you do know this if you watch my channel, I did an interview with Fabio and talked about his life. Uh, he used to live in, uh, Ukraine, his wife's Ukrainian, and he lived in Ukraine for many years, uh, before, uh, 2022. He no longer lives in Ukraine for reasons which, uh, you know, I should be pretty self-evident. Um, he's actually Italian. Uh, he's not Ukrainian, uh. But I uh, started recently started trying to uh, learn how to read Cyrillic, uh, and so uh, so I can I can uh, very slowly spell out. Actually, it's more that I can't see the damn letters because my eyes are bad. Kvatkovskaya, Kvatkovskaya. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I just, you know, this idea that there's this whole other alphabet out there that I can't, that like, uh, I can't, I can't understand kind of bothered me. So I just sat down and like memorized all the letters. Uh, anyway. <clears throat> uh, we got a few more minutes, about 10 more minutes for, uh, questions. I uh, want to remind you that Aaron Ciotti is going to be uh, streaming at 3. He's going to post the link to his stream as we come to the end of my stream. And if you guys are loving the streaming, you can uh, you can watch, can you just transition over when when I get done. When I get done. Um, we'll take a few more questions. Blunty's got this one pinned. Blunty, you can pin any other sort of high-priority questions you think you'd really like me to get in the last 10 minutes. Uh, David Hussman says, do you have any advice on testing used gear like goggles and remotes? Is there common breaking points to look for or is gear generally robust? Um, so for a remote, generally I would say that remotes are pretty robust. If it doesn't visibly have broken switches, if it isn't visibly banged up, what I would do, and uh, I'm not going to take the time to show this to you on stream because we're coming to the end of the stream and I don't want to take a bunch of time with it. But I would go into the screen on the remote that shows the outputs. And, and like most, it, so first of all, it should absolutely be like an Edge TX or Open TX remote. Not like a Futaba, not like a Spectrum, not like a Fly Sky, a Free Sky. Those are fine products, but they are more tailored and oriented towards fixed wing and pilots and so forth. For FPV, pretty much the de facto standard is going to be an OpenTX or EdgeTX radio, like a Radio Master or a Jumper. FreeSky radios used to run it. Now they don't. That's that's neither here nor there. Um, I wouldn't really consider buying a FreeSky Spectrum Futaba radio first and foremost for FPV drones. Not that they can't do it, but that it's a cultural thing, right? All of the tutorials, all of the setup guides, they're going to be using an HTX or OpenTX radio, and you're just going to kind of have to figure it out on your own if you're not using that, and it's going to be a big burden. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is go into the screen that shows, like, all of the inputs and, like, just move the sticks up and down and see if the out output is, is uh, consistent. And, and move all the switches and just make sure that all the physical controls work. And then <coughs> generally, <coughs> you're going to be doing okay. If the radio is broken, somehow you could still probably easily put in an external module and be okay. As far as goggles, check them for burned screens. But other than that, the goggles are probably, there's not that much to break on them. Um, what do you think about an FPV school in real life? Mark FPV asks, Mark, I would, I, so I think that would be amazing. I would 100% be interested in like, if there was a place where, you know, I could, I could go and like teach people in real life, I would be so excited. That was what I was hoping would happen when I started doing quad camp with Rotor Riot. I wanted to get back in the classroom. I, I have experience professionally as a classroom instructor and I wanted to have a classroom environment for FPV. 
the reality is that I don't think there's any way to make that a profitable business. The amount you would have to charge your students. So first of all, students won't want to travel to come to your school in real life because that costs them another $500. So let's say you're going to go do a week long course. Okay. So they're going to take off work for a week. That's going to cost them money. They're going to fly or drive to your location. That's going to cost them money. They're going to stay in a hotel. That's going to cost them money. And they're going to pay you for the course. That's too much money. And I, I speak from experience because this was one of the number one objections we got when we did quad camp was people were like, I would love to go, but I can't, even if I could afford to pay for the ticket to come to the event, I can't afford all the other incidental costs. So it has to be a school where people will be local to the school to come to the school. And you think how many metro areas are there where there are enough FPV pilots to make that a sustainable business model? Uh, pr probably not any, but like Houston has a huge, it's a huge metro area with a huge number of FPV pilots. Maybe New York City, although I don't know. New York City is a huge metro area. I don't know how, like, it's also extremely hostile to FPV. There's probably a lot of FPV pilots there. Maybe it could work in New York City. Maybe LA, although LA is also incredibly hostile to, to drones in general. Um, so it's not a sustainable business model. It could be okay as a one-off but not as a business model. It would be really cool. <coughs> now, obviously, Jake Pickett points out, yeah, the Ukrainian military has FPV schools. That's different, and you know it. That's different, and you know it. That's, that's not the kind of thing we're talking about, probably. Uh, my flight controller doesn't have a buzzer pad, and I want to put the V-Fly Finder Mini on it. How do I do that? Gray Fox, you remap, probably a UART's going to be, or the LED strip pad might work, but you remap a pad to the the beeper or buzzer resource, I don't remember the name of it, that will work as long as you're using a self-powered buzzer like the VFly Finder Mini. You're going to remap, and you can look up my video about resource remapping, and that will tell you the steps you need to do it. <coughs> Why isn't stereoscopic FPV a thing now? Well, it was a thing. Uh, like, let me find for you what I'm looking for. Like this. The Blackbird 2 FPV 3D camera. This existed. This, this is another one that, that existed. Another 3D FPV camera. Um, here is a SkyZone system that SkyZone sold that had SkyZone goggles, a, a custom 3D video transmitter, and a 3D camera. So this existed and was not very popular and fell apart. Um, there are various reasons for it. I'm not, I think uh, here at the end of the stream with only two minutes to go, I don't think I should dive into them. Uh, but uh, here's a great article from Drone Girl in 2021. And uh, uh, basically, cost and complexity is the reason. Nowadays, goggles don't even bother supporting it. So, uh, but I want to point out to you that it has been tried and just didn't really take up, take off. Um, what camera do you use for your streams? This is a Lumix G85. Um, not that it matters. Uh, the, I mean, the Lumix G85 is a fine camera. I like it and it gets the job done for me and it's not ridiculously expensive. Um, there are the main weakness of the G85 is its complete lack of usable autofocus. Uh, but that's okay for a stream because you just have fixed focus. But if I like want to hold something up and show it to you, it, the camera's in manual focus the whole time because the autofocus is garbage. Um, there is a lot of tweaking of the settings 
to get the image to look as good as possible. Not that the image out of the camera doesn't look good, but like the, like the, uh, for example, uh, hold on. I know the stream's almost over, but like, for example, uh, this is what the image coming out of the camera looks like with no LUT. Um, that's what it looks like with the LUT to help with the color. And that image that you saw is still heavily tweaked to get the image as neutral as possible and as good as possible so that the LUT can work well. The, the uh, image out of the camera is not spectacular, but if you're, if you're good at color grading, you can get good results out of it. Uh, we got a super chat here from Vikas. Uh, Integra goggles are blurry around the edge. Shit out of luck? Yeah, I mean, like... You could you could try to focus them, but if you can't get them focused and, and centered on your eyes, your your eyes may be particularly wide or particularly narrow, and there's not a lot you can do about that. Just one thing I would think about around the yeah. edge. Uh, try taking the goggles and shoving them into your face or pulling them out from your face just a little bit and make sure that that's not causing the blurriness because you're just like a little Valid. off in the distance. So. Valid. Yeah, you may want thicker or thinner foam. That's a good point, Melody. Thank you for that. Uh, podcast wants to know if I'll cover 3D in my Learn to Fly series. Thank you for 14 South African men. Probably not, but you never know. There's a lot. 3D is pretty niche, and I'm not an expert in it. So I don't like to teach things that I'm not at least, you know, minimally competent in. Um, Anthony Fraschetti, thank you for a $5 super chat. I want to get the new Radio Master land controller. What do I need to look for in a vehicle to be able to transfer to ELRS? <coughs> so... You want to be aware that there are some advanced functions like gyro steering and anti-lock braking, and those advanced functions may not work with the MT-12 um, because they're built into the receiver uh, that you would be taking out of the vehicle. As long as the vehicle doesn't have those advanced functions, as long as it is simple steering, throttle, brake, etc., then you could just put an ELRS receiver in and you're good to go. The other thing you need is it needs to have a standalone receiver or it needs to be bindable to the 4-in-1 uh, version of the MT-12, which some but not all... Uh, so like if you've got a really tiny remote control car with a built-in receiver, you're not going to put an express ELRS receiver in it and it may not be able to bind to the MT-12, in which case you may be out of luck. Uh, so it's still a really great radio, but there are there are qu quite a few uh, models that you would not want to use with it, either because you would lose some features like gyro controlled steering or there's some there's some models that have speed sensitive steering where the faster the model is going, the, the, the less the lower the steering rate is. And when it goes slower, the steering so that you don't just flip it over, turn in the wheel when you're going fast. That's the kind of thing that may not be possible with an express alert receiver, at least today. Um, that is going to bring us to the end of the stream, though. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow night, and we'll see how whether my cough has gotten better or worse. Uh, thank you guys for coming out, and Blunty, thank you, as always, uh, for doing this with me. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Uh, head on over to Aaron Ciotti's stream. Someone said you should tell people who Aaron Ciotti is. He is a drone pilot, FPV pilot, professional. He does his cinematic work. Uh, and his specialty, if I, if I could say so, is, is in micro drones. Some people call him the micro king, especially his wife. Am I right? No, I don't. I don't. I'm being told that that's a boomer joke and it's not funny. Okay, fair. Uh, Aaron Ciotti, uh, he does, he does uh, a, lot of, a lot of content about it. Yeah, go check him out. All right. Uh, bye, everybody.